time you have this cycle, some are directly affected because those activities are commoditizing in their space. And then you get the secondary effect. So it's all the companies. So in the last, um, if you take, say, uh, commoditization and the means of mass communication, and there are a whole bunch of companies who thought, this is great, it's going to reduce our distribution costs, et cetera, et cetera, newspapers and so forth. But of course, it reduced barriers to entry into that space. They suddenly found new competitors, bloggers, et cetera. So it turned from being a positive to suddenly being a negative. Um, and then there was all the other side industries who didn't realize that there was actually a, you know, a barrier to entry into their business, a key part of their business. And so they got hit. And that, that was everybody from sort of like in the retail industry all the way to travel agents. So something like commodity of a range of IT activities. It's going to hit software vendors, hosting companies, those sorts of people you'd imagine first. But it's also going to hit media companies, insurance, banking, and a whole range of companies. Now, the next one after that is commoditization, or almost certainly, you can't be 100% certain, but it's almost, is commoditization of manufacturing processes. And so those few companies who sort of escape this war, particularly in the manufacturing construction industry, will get sucked into that one. I think uh, it, it resonates in terms of what we're seeing out there. You know, the, the technology is there, the cloud services are there, users are, are battling with all the devices that they're bringing into the organization. You know, they're using SaaS services, mobile applications. You know, this is not new. You know, users are bringing these services into the organization. The organization has to cope with that, has to adapt to that. You know, we're seeing some companies adapting to it and some who are ignoring it and, and hoping it'll go away. It won't go away. It's like, you know, chasing a bouncy ball down the stairs. You're not going to be able to catch it. So, so why then do you think do people ignore it? I think it's fear of, of not knowing what to do, how it affects their, their company policies. You know, the truth is actually, you know, it's, it's easier to be done. You know, there is technology out there to be able to cope with it. It's just a matter of looking at that and open their eyes and embracing it. Don't fight it, feature it. You know, it's, it's a new opportunity for IT to show, you know, that it can keep up. Take the minister's point here. There's a huge opportunity for Irish companies. But I think that in Ireland at the moment, we're spending an awful lot of time talking about the, about cloud without any substance to it. It's, it's a catchphrase. We've built a huge infrastructure in the company that should enable innovation to happen through the cloud and maybe to leave some legacy after the, the boom years we've had. And cloud might be the thing that will allow us to actually capture that or create a legacy. And that legacy is having an indigenous Irish companies um, that are innovative and not just supporting the multinationals like my own or Grace's or whatever. What's the legacy for Ireland? I mean, so I think there's a choice that maybe government need to make, the government need to make about what they want us to do. Do they want us to be an infrastructure supporter of cloud and support the big multinationals, or do we want to grow indigenous businesses to make our, truly make Ireland the cloud capital of the world rather than an infrastructure supporter? I mean, that's a choice that has to be made. And today I don't think it's clear because we're in a deep recession, we'll grab onto anything. We want the money because we have to survive. And where will we be after we survive? What does survival mean? I think they're the two choices maybe for us. And the tr companies like Trend or Citrix or O2, we can make money here, but. Who's going to be the Irish guy sitting up here that started a company that becomes as big as Trend or Citrix or O2? And that's not clear to me. And I don't know whether you look at it, Simon, you look at Ireland, would it be the same for you? How do you see it? Um, so um, there is competition between governments. Uh, all governments are trying to, at this moment in time, uh, make their environment the most attractive for these new industries. So I gave the example of the UK government in terms of what they're doing in terms of open source, open standards, changing and reducing costs in terms of big suppliers, encouraging small medium enterprise, pushing ODI, which is the open data initiative, transparency, open data. Uh, you've got um, silicon roundabout, as they call it, which is around shortage, heavy investment and so forth, they are tr trying to create a center of gravity for talent and skills and create the working conditions to create those new industries. Um, the one thing about uh, this particular war is that whilst past industries get disrupted by the new players, and they usually are new entrants who provide large-scale utility services, you do get the explosion of new activities shortly afterwards, and it's capitalizing on that because those new industries then become the new giants. So every government is trying to do this. 
it was interesting to listen to Simon and I suppose you reflect upon your own organisation and it, how it reacts to change and also as you say what we see with our customers so um, I, I think for me the overriding thing is the level of uncertainty that exists for people at the, at the moment and when I hear what the Minister had to say about things like cloud and Ireland as a cloud capital centre what do we mean by that sometimes I think Anthony touched on it what, what do we mean what does the success look for like for us in those areas we have some great track records in Ireland of how we adapt to change how we adapt to different industry trends uh, and how we remain attractive as a location. So certainly in terms of multinationals and we have representation of them here, we're really good at it. But the challenge, and certainly in the environment we're in at the moment, is how do these technologies help our, our indigenous companies and our startups to be very different, to change how they deliver services to their customers. What I see as different at the moment is that a lot of this change has really been driven by the end user. The demand from the end users really is driving the change more than anything else, I think. And I suppose for us, it's really interesting as well, I had a quick flick through the delegate list, and it's interesting to see the vast range of different kind of companies that are represented here today. Uh, because there's such an intersection of different industries that are affected by the topic of cloud. And what do we mean by it? Is it infrastructure? Is it hardware? Is it services? Is it telecommunications? It's all of those things, which is why you do have confusion as well. So for us, I suppose, just to give an O2 perspective, I mean, for us, clearly, we're coming more with a telecommunications background, a distribution of services background, uh, uh, and certainly cloud fits squarely within that. It's around how IT is consumed, and for us, it's around how we can facilitate our customers to consume that and the availability of data in different ways to them on different devices in different places, wherever they are, whatever services they want to consume, and whatever devices they want to use. Uh, but very much driven by customers' uh, hunger and appetite for information, for data, for the blending of their personal life with their work life, uh, for the blending of the devices they use in their personal life and their work. All of these things are very much a part of what's, what's driving the change around cloud for me. On this panel, I probably represent a the, the small to medium sized company. We're not a multinational, we're a traditional systems integrator, a uh, traditional channel partner. A um, number of years back, you know, probably the cloud was driven by, or the, I, I call it the, the greatest marketing event ever in the IT industry. Uh, as that man, as, um, as uh, Simon mentioned earlier on, this was around in 1966. Did you say that book was written? 1966. Where, where this market. prediction was made. And th this has been around for quite a while. So in our own business, we would have seen at a very practical level, this was going to eat our business eventually. Th this was a guarantee. What we did was we built environments for our customers. We virtualized them. We were a channel partner for the major vendors like HP. Uh, and this was our bread and butter. Now, the next stage, the evolution is, as this man said, it's all going to move to utility. Okay, so we had to make the step into that into that next generation. We had to pick up the customer base moving. Um, what I find interesting about the, the the government's view, and I'd like to get um, people's feedback on it, is we we talk about the great opportunity that's available there for cloud, and there definitely is. IDC would state that moving to a cloud platform can save you potentially 30 percent in your cost base. Okay. There's not a company in the world, I don't think, that can reduce their cost base by 30% without having an impact on their HR and their, their human capital. I think anybody who runs a company in here will understand what percentage of your total cost is represented by human capital. And in any environment where you start creating efficiencies, like utility computing, where are those efficiencies going to come from? So I remember back in 1990 when I started work and I got very excited about the fact that I saw my first laptop. And what was said at the time was that we're going to eventually move to a three-day week. That's what was said at the time. And I was quite excited about that when I was 21. I thought I was a good gig, yeah. Uh, a four-day weekend I thought, I thought was excellent. What it actually created at the end of the day was actually longer working hours as a result of the IT explosion. And we're all working 16, 70 hours a week because we have to be so much more efficient. Um, my, my fear is that traditional, and not my fear, it will happen. Traditional models will disappear over the next couple of years, um, and there will be job loss. That won't get as much attention in the, in the media when they start slipping away. And an example I, I gave one time was the traditional video stores. Yeah, you know the likes of Netflix are going to close them down. You're going to be talking to your kids in 20 years' time about how when you dated your mother, this is what you did on a Friday night. You went out and brought a video and rented two videos, yeah? And your kids say, wow, isn't that amazing? You, didn't, you weren't able to flick it. So traditional industries will disappear, yeah? So are Ireland in a good position to, to make up that loss? Because that won't get as much attention, I guarantee you. One of the things, um, you notice I talk about efficiency. 
I don't talk about cost reduction, and there is a reason for this. So I, I built, um, a friend of mine is a chap called Ben Black, who's the guy who proposed EC2 to Jeff Bezos, around about 2003, 2004. And uh, in those days, I was CEO of a Canon subsidiary, and we'd built our own private hardware as a service. And then we subsequently, in 2005, 2006, launched the first public uh, platform as a service. Um, and I used to, in, at the beginning, think it was going to reduce our cost and all the rest of it. And then what I realized is it doesn't reduce cost at all. You just end up doing more stuff. And if you look back in, in computing, for today, for $1,000, I get a million times more compute resource than I do in the 1980s. So obviously, my budget has reduced a million fold during that time. No, uh, we've just ended up doing more. You do get a transition of jobs every time in this war phase some of the past jobs and the past industries get disrupted, and that's perfectly normal, the gas uh, lamp lighters. And you get people like Hawking's back in the electricity age predict doom and gloom. And the doom and gloom is because you can see the jobs that are going, but the new industries are uncertain. We don't know what they are. We don't know that radio and Hollywood and Telegraph and all the rest of it. So you can't see the jobs that are coming. So every time we, we go through these, we do get these predictions of doom and gloom. Um, but that's inevitable because we can see what's going, not what's coming. 